Now we come this evening to the shortest letter in the New Testament. As with the previous one, the author describes himself as the elder. Traditionally it's been assumed that the author's the Apostle John. I see no reason to doubt that. There are obvious similarities between this letter and 2 John, which we looked at last month. The recipients are people, he says, whom I love in truth. John rejoiced greatly because of the good reports he'd received about them. They were walking in the truth. Both letters talk about truth and love. Both contain a warning. The endings are very similar. I hope to come to them and speak face to face rather than writing. So maybe you're wondering, is this just going to be a repeat of last month's sermon? Well, the answer is no. The focus of the letter is different from 2 John. 2 John was addressed to this ambiguous elect lady and her children. Was that a person or was it a church? But 3 John is addressed to a specific person. And it mentions two other men by name. In fact, we could structure the whole letter around these three men. And as we think about these three men, we're reminded that, as Daniel Aiken says, all of us share an invaluable possession. It goes with us wherever we go. Amazingly, it also goes where we do not go. And what, have, what you think of this prized possession is not necessarily what others think of it. What do you think he's talking about? Your reputation. Your reputation is the view that other people have of your character, your integrity, your attitudes and behaviour. Maybe good or bad. Positive or negative. But we all have a reputation. People will watch you. They will talk about you. You can't escape your reputation. It goes before you. It goes with you. It remains behind you. It lingers long after you've gone. So it's something that we need to think about. How do other people think and talk about you? Now there is a sense in which we shouldn't care about other people's opinions. We shouldn't let a desire for popularity deflect us from doing what's right. We shouldn't be intimidated into following a crowd to do evil. But at the same time, we do need to be concerned about how our lives impact people's view of Christianity. Jesus says to us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Our reputation. And to John, the Apostle's concern was with false teaching. You remember he warned that many deceivers have gone out into the world. He told his readers not to receive those people. Here in 3 John, his concern is with a specific individual, Diotrephes. And the problem is not so much with what the man is teaching as with what he's doing. Now it's possible that the two are related. It could be that he sympathises with false teachers, therefore he doesn't want true gospel preachers to influence the church. But there's no need to assume that. John doesn't say anything about his doctrinal position. So, in all probability, that isn't the issue here. But before we come to that man, let's look at the one to whom John is writing. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. We don't know anything about Gaius apart from what we read in this letter. There are three men by that name mentioned in the New Testament in connection with <coughs> three men. But Gaius is one of the common names, like John today perhaps. How many people do you know with that name? There's no reason to suppose that this Gaius is one of the ones mentioned elsewhere. But it does seem clear from the way John writes that he has a position of responsibility, leadership in the local church. Seems a visiting evangelist stayed with him rather than with others. And would he, 
John have spoken so openly about Diotrephes to anyone who wasn't a church leader. Obviously he also, he's someone for whom John has a high regard. He calls him beloved in the first verse. He addresses him as beloved three times, verses 2, 5 and 11. He calls him the beloved verse, <coughs> whom I love. And that word I there is very emphatic. When I was learning Latin many years ago, one of the first verbs we learnt was amare, to love. So we'd recite amo, amas, amat, and so on. Maybe some of you did that as well. I love, you love, he, she, or it loves. And the ending of the verb told you who it was that loved. And it's the same in Greek. When John writes agapeo, he's saying, I love. He doesn't need to add anything more. But in fact, what he writes is ego agapeo. I, even I, love. He's emphasising the fact that he loves Gaius. And he expresses their breadth of his concern for his friend in his greeting. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. John values Gaius as a person, not just a worker for the truth. He's concerned about the whole person, body and soul. And I'm sure you've been at prayer meetings where the whole focus has been on people's bodily needs. And so we pray about Mr. Jones's bad back, and Mrs. Brown's arthritis, and Miss Smith's migraines. And you sometimes wonder, is that all they can think about? Is that the limit of their vision? And it's very easy to react against that, isn't it? To point out that Paul's letters, Paul's prayers, he never mentions that kind of thing. His prayers are for spiritual concerns. If you look at Ephesians, for instance, what does Paul pray for there? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Or that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's a very different kind of prayer, isn't it? Spiritual things are important, they should be our priorities, and they're John's priorities here. He rejoices because Gaius is walking in the truth. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. He commends Gaius for his love. But those things are not the only things that matter. So he also prays that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. We never promised health and wealth. They're not automatic. We live in a fallen world. It affects every area of our lives. And we should pray for health, for financial matters. Recognising that they are in God's hands. And this prayer for, of John for Gaius shows it is legitimate to be concerned about them and to value them. Even though we know that our spiritual health is more important. It's entirely legitimate for our prayers to include the physical aspect <coughs> of health. But Dan Riken points out one application that rises naturally from the prayer. Suppose that when I prayed for you, I asked, as John does here, God will, that God would bless you physically to the same degree that you are healthy spiritually. Happen if he answered my prayer? Would you be hale and hearty? Or would you be sick in bed, even at death's door? I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. What do 
to learn about this man Gaius? How do we know his soul prospers? Well, first we see that Gaius is walking in the truth. Brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. You can only bear testimony to what you can see. So it's obvious Gaius must have been a transparent and open Christian. His light was shining. He wasn't hiding it. His truth and love were known to all. Even those who were strangers, as it were, what you do for the brethren for strangers. They could see his character. They could give testimony to it. <coughs> and God says walking in the truth that means more than just giving assent to it it means applying it to your behaviour it means there's no gap between your profession and your practice creed and conduct match each other God says walking in the truth and then secondly he's serving faithfully you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers it seems from the context he was providing hospitality for visiting preachers no doubt of another good works. And third, he's showing love. People have borne witness of your love before the church. One way that his love is shown is in practical action, caring for visiting missionaries. Second John warned against providing support for false teachers. That's not become an excuse for failing to support true <coughs> gospel workers. And John encourages guys to keep up the good work. If you send them forward on your journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. The standard he gives there for helping gospel workers to do so in a manner worthy of God. Since the teachers are messengers for Christ, you teach them as, treat them as you would treat Christ himself. In the same way that God treats you. God lavishes his gifts and his grace on us. So we're not to be parsimonious and penny-pinching in our support of missionary work. Maybe you've heard of the deacons praying for their minister. Lord, you keep him humble and we'll keep him poor. That's not a biblical attitude. And John goes on to explain why it's so important to help gospel workers in this worthy manner. They went forth for his name's sake, more literally, for the sake of the name. Taking nothing from the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such, that we may become fellow workers for the truth. So those verses give us three reasons for supporting gospel workers. First, they're not mere visitors, not even mere Christian visitors. They're God's servants. They went out for the sake of the name. They're Christian missionaries. They're to be welcomed for the name, for the sake of the one they serve. But Jesus sent to his disciples when he sent them out. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Yes, we should be hospitable to ordinary Christians as we have opportunity. But it's especially important to help those who are devoting their lives to Christ's service. And secondly... These missionaries would not look for support from the pagans to whom they witnessed, taking nothing from the Gentiles. They weren't like many wandering non-Christian teachers of that day, or even the begging friars of the Middle Ages, who made a living out of their vagrancy. They didn't attempt to finance God's work with the world's money. They depended on the generosity, the gifts of the church. They're not peddling the word of God. As Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians. So they avoided the scandal of these other travelling teachers who prided themselves in making money out of their teaching. Now certainly Christian ministers and teachers have the right to be supported by those who benefit from their service. Paul insists on that several times. Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Galatians 6. 6. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honour. And that's a word which usually refers to finance. Especially those who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And the labourer is worthy of his wages. Paul quotes that verse again about the ox in 1 Corinthians 9. 
So he argues that the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But a Christian congregation supporting its minister is one thing. Missionaries begging money from unbelievers is another. And then the third reason John gives for arguing we should support these people is because in doing so we become fellow workers for the truth with them. You remember how in his second letter he warned against helping the false teachers because those who share, he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. But in the same way, helping true gospel workers means we share in their good work, their service of the truth. James Boyce comments, here's a great word for those who would like to be engaged in frontline Christian work, but who cannot be, owing to ill health, circumstances or other pressing obligations. In God's sight, those are fellow workers who support others by their gifts, interest and prayers. Or as Barclay writes, a man's circumstances may be such that he cannot become a missionary or a preacher. Life may have put him in a position where he must get on with a secular job and where he must stay in the one place and carry out the routine duties of life and living. But where he cannot go, his money and his prayers and his practical support can go. And if he gives that support, he has made himself an ally of the truth. It's not everyone who can be, so to speak, in the front line. But every man, by supporting those who are in the front line, can make himself an ally of the truth. So we have those three reasons for supporting gospel workers, as Gaius has been doing. <clears throat> there is the right to be supported, and they won't get the support from non-Christians. They're serving God, and we become fellow servants, fellow workers with them. We have this man Gaius. He has a reputation for walking in the truth, for serving faithfully, for showing love. He's exemplary in his support for gospel workers. What about you? In this connection, may I encourage you to focus your giving on specifically Christian organisations. Yes, there's nothing wrong with helping charities that do good work, relieving poverty, providing clean drinking water or whatever. But secular bodies can raise their support from non-Christians. The help that they give does not come in the name of Christ. It doesn't bring glory to him. It's not accompanied by the message of the gospel. So our limited resources are most, most often better used in directly Christian work. Work done for the sake of the name. Here's this first man then, Gaius, a good example to follow. Then we come to verse 9, and a very different character, Diotrephes. What do we learn about him? What kind of reputation does he have? The first thing we learn is <clears throat> that he rejected John's authority. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes does not receive us. We don't have a copy of John's letter, so we can't be sure what it was saying. Quite likely, he was writing to commend the travelling evangelists, but Diotrephes refuses to follow John's instructions. It's not a rare thing, is it? Only an earlier example of the same rejection seen by those today who prefer the opinions of the latest theologian or the latest popular religious writer to the binding authority of God's inerrant word. He rejected John's authority. And then secondly, he loves to have the preeminence. He wants to be top dog. He won't play second fiddle even to an apostle. And that may well be what lies behind his attitude to other gospel workers. He sees them as threats, as competitors, rather than as fellow workers for the truth. And that's still to be seen sometimes in the church, isn't it? You have a minister, perhaps, who's been in this position for a long time, and then a young man comes up who has 
great promise and gifts. But the older man doesn't want to give him the freedom to display them in case it puts him in the shape. The pastor is supposed to be a shepherd, not a swaggering dictator. Peter exhorts, the shepherd of the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. That's not what Diotrephes is like. His outlook is the opposite of Christ's attitude. You know that familiar passage in Philippians. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Christ was willing to follow that path of service and sacrifice, put the needs of others above his own, regardless of the cost. He puts himself first. The example he follows is that of Satan, not of Christ. Stott comments that personal vanity still lies at the root of most dissensions in every local church today. That's not all. John says he's been prating against us with malicious words. Word, Greek verb prating, comes from a root that's used of water, boiling up, throwing off bubbles. Since bubbles are empty and useless, the word came to mean indulgence in empty or useless talk. His words are malicious gossip, wicked nonsense as the ESV translates it. And gossip and slander are perhaps the most common sins against church leaders. James warns, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, sets on fire the course of nature, it is set on fire by hell. Dr. Peace's tongue needs to be tamed before it sets the whole church on fire. But he goes further still. He's not content with malicious words. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. He won't let true gospel workers into the church. He throws out of the church those who support them. Now we don't know whether he had legitimate authority as an elder in the church, or whether it was just a lay leader, maybe the rich man in whose big house the church met. By the way, he was throwing his weight around in a most damaging way. And this sad story is followed by the only major command in the letter. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Don't copy the bad example that Diotrephes sets. Don't give in to whatever pressure he's exerting. It's a lesson for us too. Choose your heroes carefully. You'll become like the example you imitate. He who does good is of God, but he who does, does evil has not seen God. And we see God in Christ, the living word. It's revealed by faith to faith in the pages of the written word. For those who do evil have not yet seen who God is, and not recognised the truth of Scripture. The point John's making is that character and behaviour evidence your relationship to God or your lack of it. Consistent evil behaviour is evidence of a lack of regeneration. A Greek scholar A.T. Robertson once wrote an article on diatrophies for a denominational paper. Later on, the editor told him that 25 deacons had stopped taking the paper in order to show their resentment against being personally attacked in the paper. Guess how many names Robertson had mentioned in his article? None. But they 
saw their characters in what it was said about Diotrephes. So he rejects the authority of the apostle. He puts himself first. He lords it over others. He slanders God's servants. He's a bully who insists on having his own way, whatever it costs. Is there anything of Diotrephes in you? Well, it's a relief to turn to the next man John mentions. To our David Jackman's headings, we've had Gaius, a Christian friend, and Diotrephes, a Christian fraud. And now we have Demetrius, a Christian follower. That picks up on the word that John used in verse 11. To imitate is to follow. That's how the AV always translates the Greek word. Now we don't know for certain, it's quite likely Demetrius was the man who carried this letter to Gaius. Apparently Gaius doesn't know Demetrius. So John gives him a testimonial. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness and you know that our testimony is true. What a contrast to diatrophy. It's a threefold testimonial. First, Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone. Second, he has a good testimony from the truth itself. That seems to mean that the Christian genuineness of Demetrius didn't need a human witness. It was self-evident. He embodied the truth in the way that he lived. His life conformed to it. He lived in a manner consistent with God's word of truth. So when he's measured by that standard, the truth itself confirms his quality. And then John adds his own personal testimony, whether the we therefore is John with apostolic authority, whether he includes the church from which he writes, the friends who send their greetings, not sure. But given the context of verse 11, it seems likely John's holding Demetrius up again as an example of a good role model to imitate. You can point people to Demetrius and say, be like him. Could he say the same about you? Gaius, Diotrephes, Demetrius. Of course, there's also a fourth man in this letter. The Apostle John who wrote it. What does it tell us about him? Let me suggest to you, it shows the heart of a true pastor. He stands for the truth. Nothing delights him more than to hear of people walking in the truth. He's willing to confront evil, whether in the form of false teaching, as in 2 John, or in the form of ungodly living. He's concerned that belief and behaviour should balance each other. And motivating it all is a heart of love. Love for his saviour, love for other people. He has a genuine concern for their well-being. Desire that they prosper in all things. That heart comes out in the closing words of the letter. John longs to see Gaius, to speak to him face to face, literally mouth to mouth. There's no substitute for genuine Christian fellowship. Yes, we can be thankful for modern technology that allows us to broadcast services so people who can't be there in person can benefit from them. But they're not enough. Yes, you can listen to a much more talented preacher online. But a virtual service is no substitute for personal contact with people who care for you. As Douglas O'Donnell says, fellowship is more than sharing a cup of coffee after the service. It's sharing life together. The joys and sorrows, triumphs and defeats, so that together we might fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith, and long for the glory of God's gospel to cover the earth. The personal touch comes out in the closing words of the letter. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Greet them by name. John Stott comments, Christians should not lose their individual identity and importance in the group. God surely means each local fellowship to be sufficiently small and closely knit for the pastors and the members to know each other personally and be able to greet each other by name. 
The good shepherd calls his own sheep by name, and the shepherds and sheep should know each other by name also. So this letter shows us four men, four reputations. And the question as we reach the end of this little letter is this. What does your reputation say about Christ and his gospel? As followers of Jesus, our lives and reputations ought to reflect his love, his affection, his hospitality toward one another. Oh, may God help us to do that.